Well, hello everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I want to thank you uh, for joining us again in this uh, rather uh, serious and tough, um, you know, video series on the status of women in Islam. Uh, I mean, again, want to apologize in advance. Um, you may hear things that are, in your view, offensive, but all we're doing really is we're sharing from the primary sources of Islam and. While I myself do not like really to venture into topics like this, sometimes it's necessary when you are dealing with a uh, bigger picture called political Islam, because that's part of the fabric of political Islam. You have to deal with different aspects of the society, different aspects of uh, you know the community and interactions and transactions and so on and so forth. With me here uh, once again is our dear friend and uh, brother here, um, Dr. Bill Warner. Bill. I cannot really express to you uh, my gratitude for having you here, uh, joining me and sharing from your own studies and your own experience with uh, these topics. Your own ministry is called the Center for Political Islam, so no better guy to talk about that <laughs> than someone who have invested most of his life and career into understanding it and also simplifying it for people. Particularly simplifying it. you know. Westerners have a peculiar attitude about Islam. Number one is it's almost impossible to understand, but they also know that you can be an illiterate Egyptian and be a Muslim. That's right. So <clears throat> if an, illeg if an illeg Ill not illegitimate, illiterate peasant can understand it, why can't you and I understand it? That's right. That's right. And so what we say is, yes, you can understand it. And one of those, I found that one of the biggest things that people do know about Muhammad was Aisha married at six and consummated at nine. So we not only have the child marriage, but we also have polygamy, which I must say as a guy sounds like it has some advantages, but when we discover the actual history of polygamy and in, under Muhammad's time, it was not that happy in the harem. That is, you would think that if you're gonna be in Muhammad's harem, that you would lead a most wonderful life. Right. How, how good can it be? You're married to the perfect man. But it doesn't quite work out like that. That's because true. we discover that there were divisions within the harem and that they took sides with each other, they had squabbles with each other, they didn't like each other that much, they had fights. It demanded even a divine threat against them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. When Muhammad like made a promise to them that, uh, okay, I, I'm not going to do this because they were fighting, you know. Um, I'm going to divorce all of you. That's right. So uh, they frustrated him and then the, his God stepped in and... Took care of the business. Exactly. Which actually... To step way ahead, there is the beginning of the seed of this difference between Shia and Sunni because it was both Ali and Umar said, divorce them all, there's plenty of women out there. And I'm forgetting now which one it was, I'm being vague on camera. But anyway, that these examples lead to the way that women are treated today. It's not just a historical example, it's the perfect pattern, the perfect model. That's right. And many women today, I mean, can you blame them if they are concerned that my husband can go and marry another one? My husband can divorce me. Because in, in their mind, they're just an object, like you said. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, hey, you're here to uh, have children. They're, you're here to clean. You're here to cook. You know, uh, I'm the one who's providing for you. The, uh, the Quran says I'm superior to you. Uh, so which woman in the right mind is going to try to antagonize a man uh, that can go ahead and marry another one? Right. This gets to be a problem as the woman gets older, by the way. That's right, that's right. Some Muslim women get somewhat desperate as they get older because they know that there's some woman who can come into the house that has, as my friend said, tight skin, and now then they're gonna be pushed down. That's right. As a matter of fact, so much so, one of the women in the harem when Muhammad was no longer pleased with her that much, she says, look, let me just stay a wife. You don't have to have sex with me. That's Sauda, yeah. Sauda. Yeah, and then she told him even she's, she was gonna give him the night her night uh, to spend an extra night with Aisha, Aisha. you know, so uh, I mean, it's it's pretty sad when you come across these stories, and these are stories documented in the Sira, you know, in, in the biography of Muhammad, and in the Hadith, you know, we're not making up these stories. I mean, they're right. right there for anyone to access, by the way, not just me and you. Actually, there's something that we haven't really dealt with, is that for the first time in human history, the doctrine of Islam can be understood by anybody. Before this, it's been professionals, but now then, Anybody who watches this program can read the books. They're simple to read. Exactly. Reach your own conclusions. And remember, if Muhammad did it, it's Islam. Absolutely. So in the topic of marriage, of course, I want to uh, you know, venture on this uh, a little bit. Uh, polygamy goes hand in hand with, with marriage. Uh, the husband have uh, basically the right to marry 
up to four wives. At least that's the traditional interpretation. There are other views that would say uh, that up to four is given to us as an example. In other, war, you, uh, in other way, you can keep on marrying, actually, because the verse actually would say marry once or twice or thrice or four times. So they say, you see, you can just keep adding. Right. And you say, okay, when would you stop? They say, well, we, we can mimic the prophet. The prophet has te- traditionally 13 wives. So some will go up to 13. Right. Uh, and you would ask, well, if it is four, indeed, why didn't the prophet, for instance, follow that order? Obviously, it wasn't the case for the prophet. Well, I don't remember the exact verse, but in the, there's a Quran verse which basically says, we make these rules for the ordinary person. Muhammad doesn't have to follow the That's rules. Right. That's right. Actually, Muhammad didn't have to follow a lot of rules. That's true. In fact, his own young wife, Aisha, said, you know, I'm really amused that your Lord steps in to help you all the time. I mean, so whenever you needed something, technically speaking, right. a verse was revealed. Your Lord is quick to give you your desires. That's right. That's that's the way it was said. So uh, it's it's oh, there's something else we need to talk about. Aisha. Not only was she married at six, consummated at nine, but who was the favorite wife? Aisha. That's right. So it's not just she was a child bride; she was his best bride. That is correct. As a matter of fact, do I not remember that his revelations never occurred in any bed except Aisha's bed? So she was a child bride, and she was the favorite. And in some ways, the most powerful. Right. And, and you know, of course, um, you know, people probably have heard this story many times. And, you know, uh, that uh, Muhammad was 51 years of age when he proposed to marry at six years of age. OK, six years of age. And of course, our Muslim friends will jump into it and say, no, no, no. But he consummated it when she was ready. Nine years of, of age. Regardless of this. You're having a 54 years of age man marrying a nine year old, uh, you know, young woman. How come this is not the standard in the in the society these days? Because it will look very odd. I mean, if this was natural, then how come we don't see it everywhere we go in the Middle East? By the way, when I first read this hadith, I remember being at other friends' house and asking how old their daughters were, if they were if they were young, and to look at a nine year old girl and think have sex with her it's just not right yeah they call them these days uh, you know they have terminologies for that right you know if anyone will dare to you know enact in in such a you know behavior but unfortunately um, somehow uh, political correctness allows people to overlook such devastating models or teachings that are found in these sources all that to say is that Islam gives the right to the husband to marry more than one wife. And when it comes to divorce, Bill, the husband has the ultimate authority. For instance, if the husband doesn't want to divorce you, no judge can even divorce you. I mean, it's virtually impossible for the court to step in and say, okay, I'll divorce you. No, he has to divorce you. Mm-hmm. And that shows the superiority of a male. Where is the equality here? And the divorce is quite easy. For, for the, the man, of course. Was it triple talik? How do you say yeah, that? Yeah, you can say talik, talik, talik three times. She's done, you know? I haven't read that one file was delivered, you could send her a text message. Oh, yeah. I mean, recently <laughs> it's been issued. Like, they're struggling, you know, can you tweet the, the divorce? Can you text the divorce? I mean, it's like uh, technology is getting in the way now, you know? <laughs> and uh, most of the ruling is like, yeah, as long as it's coming from him and we can prove it, yes, of course, you know, it still applies. Uh, but but the point is this: no authority can forces the man to divorce you unless he chooses to do so. Mm-hmm. Okay, I mean, in other words, if he doesn't want to divorce you, guess what? Sometimes men, as a punishment for the spouse, they don't divorce and they go and marry another one. And he knows she's stuck with me now; she can't do anything, actually. And by the way, there's also a little sidebar secret dory on the how many, number, how many wives you can have, which is you can have sex slaves. Of those, there's unlimited supply. And that was applied to Muhammad when he was told you can marry up to a certain number, but now you have unlimited supply of sex slaves. No wonder he increased battle, basically, right. and, uh, <laughs> because now you have more booties, you know, basically, and getting uh, a lot of, uh, you know, rewards like this. By the way, there's something else that's an interesting picture of women found in heaven. The Huris, do I say that correctly? Yes. The Huris have one quality. They avert their gaze. They don't even look at you straight in the eye. 
They do, which means there's not even, there's not a picture of equality here even. She's to subjugate herself by looking down. Right. And, and I was like, that's just not right. This is Bill's reaction. Yeah, and this is, you know, uh, I've, I've seen a number <laughs> of documentaries that has to do with jihad. And, uh, for instance, uh, interviews were being done among those who were soon to be, uh, you know, basically suicide bombers. Okay? Mm-hmm. And they're being interviewed, and you would think they're excited because they're going to paradise. Most of them were excited that they're going to have 70 plus Hori's or 72 Hori's waiting for them. Right. And I'm like, is this the goal? To go to paradise for something like this? I mean, the whole concept itself is pretty sad, actually. I mean, it's enough that you're going to kill yourself for nothing. But now you're telling me you're killing yourself because of sexual desires, actually. Remember when Khomeini gave the young kids, the young Persians, a little green key to wear around their neck, and they ran the kids out through the fields of war to set off the mi- uh, landmines? Right, exactly. And, and it's brutal, of course, because, you know, uh, there is something about Islam that is really a man-made religion, and many of the leaders who dictate things like this are just human, who has no authority to do things, but somehow they are revered. And they're believed to be men of God who receive somehow this wisdom to be able to interpret the scripture or the sayings of the prophet or even come up with their own rulings in this case. So, um, you know, I, I want to, you know, summarize basically uh, when it comes to women uh, and their status in Islam. Uh, I mean, I want to close this particular series right now with these kind of summary reminders. Husbands in, in Islam have rights. A husband's desires must be met at once. Even if she's putting bread into the oven. That's true. And here's what the prophet says. The prophet of Allah says, When a man calls his wife to satisfy his desires, let her come to him, though she is occupied at the oven. Right. There you have it right here. Okay. So in other words, you're cooking, stop everything. <laughs> right. You know, that's not important. What's important right now, your husband says, that's it. I mean, just thinking about it, bro. Uh, you know, Bill, how can a woman, you know, view this as equality? I don't know. And then let's go on to another, you know, uh, summary conclusion. Obedience. And I, I'm reading, I tell you why, because people sometimes kind of attack and say, oh, he's just saying things. No, I want to read things for you that are basically coming from your sources. So you don't really launch uh, an accusation against me. Obedience to the husband is the key to paradise. You cannot go to paradise without the husband being in the picture. Okay, for instance, here's the hadith, for instance, that said that. There are three whose prayer will not be accepted. That's the Prophet of Islam saying. Nor their virtues be taken above. The runaway slave until he returns back to his master. The woman with whom her husband is dissatisfied and the drunk until he becomes sober. Look at the comparison that is taking <coughs> place. A slave is equal to a woman is equal to a drunken. Well, there was another analogy which Aisha connected to, which was the even, comp- she said you've compared women to dogs in one ID. That is true. He, he did because he, guess what negates your prayer, for instance? A woman, a dog, and a donkey. Right. So... Again, a logical conclusion, like Aisha reached that conclusion, you're making me equal to a dog and a donkey. Exactly. Which is not flattering. No. And, and, and can you dispute what she said? The Hadith said that. Muhammad said it. Exactly. Husband's rights are divine <coughs> rights, actually. In other words, your rights towards your woman or your right to be satisfied with her or you're feeling you know happy with her it's almost like making the man equal to god he can decide if you're going to make it to paradise or not i hadn't thought about that but that's true yeah so for instance let's take a look at what muhammad says had i ordered anybody to prostrate notice to prostrate before anyone i would have ordered women to prostrate before their husbands on account of men's right over the woman ordained by allah in other words, don't blame me. Blame Allah, you know? Right. He's the author of all these things. Right. So 
So what a woman had to do with this, you know? If Allah is the one who told her you should do these things to your husband, does she have a choice? She has no choice, and it once again makes me wonder if some women don't wind up wishing for death in the end. Absolutely, absolutely. So these are just um, summaries of things. I mean, we can go on forever, by the way, Bill, and uh, this is a promise to all of you. What we're doing you know, in this series is just introductory material. In other words, at some point, me and Bill will spend probably a number of videos going in detail talking about things like this. So for now, we don't want to really overwhelm you with so much information. We're giving you just the cream of the crop the overview and the summary that you can just at least live with for now to understand better political Islam and its treatments at different facets. In this case, the treatment of women under that particular regime called political Islam. Until we meet again, have a blessed day. Thank you for watching. Please like our video and we encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Sierra International. And be sure also to click the bell so that you receive notifications whenever we upload new videos into the channel. And finally, I like to prayerfully encourage you to become a patron through Patreon. Your giving is much needed and will enable us to produce more and more of videos like this so that we can publish them on a weekly basis. So thank you in advance.